Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Leaders on Purpose podcast. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited because this is a conversation I have been looking forward to for two months now. Today, we have the honor of sitting down with the remarkable Aviva Steinberger. She is the Director of Innovation Diplomacy at Startup Nation Central and a true leader who has a very special talent for attracting and pioneering first-time experiences. And you'll see why in just a second. We both met in Marrakesh during a three-day event that she put together with her team and partners, the first of its kind, really. And also, do you remember the first time that we took Leaders on Purpose podcast out of Casablanca to another city? Well, she was the one who made it possible. She was part of that first time also. We recorded a great episode with Google. Go check the I Am Remarkable episode with Donna Raz Levy. It is definitely worth your time. And so today, as we sit here in our brand new studios, I couldn't be more thrilled because she's here with me for the very first episode we're recording from this space. Aviva, welcome to Leaders on Purpose podcast. Thank you so much, Manal. I love the studio. It's gorgeous. Thank you. It is such an honor to have you. I mentioned we both met at this wonderful experience, really, that you put together. I recall nearly 100 women uh, business leaders from the whole region uh, gathered at Women Connect to Innovate in Marrakesh. I really met wonderful Ladies, friends, some I could call friends now from Egypt, Bahrain, Israel, Palestine, Kenya, Nigeria, Sudan, and many, many other places uh, in the region. And I also remember that really the whole group definitely left uh, energized and hopeful, hopeful and empowered. Can you first tell us how did you design Women Connect to Innovate and what was the idea behind? Sure. Um, so uh, Women Connect to Innovate came on the heels of a few other events that we've been doing at Startup Nation Central in the region in the context of changing uh, dynamics in the region and normalization agreements. We've found ourselves in a, in a position where we can engage in different ways with a focus on innovation, driving uh, the creation of resilient relationships. Uh, between um, different stakeholders in the countries. And we had done an event uh, with our partner in Morocco in Casablanca the year before. We had done an event in Manama. We've been, uh, we did an event in Israel in collaboration with, uh, with uh, the Emirates. And so um, in that context, it became very clear that there was something specific about the connections being forged between the women that were attending these events, there was a unique curiosity uh, and a unique access to opportunities for women in the region to connect at this level. And so um, we, we started looking at what would happen if we were to take women change makers, female change makers who share a passion for um, creating change, for a passion for leadership, share values around leadership, and put them together for a few days of thoughtful dialogue and see what comes of it. And it was really kind of uh, an experiment almost. And I, I don't think we realized just how thirsty some of these women were to create these kinds of connections, both outside of their own societies, cultures, and countries. Um, and looking across the region, you mentioned the countries, there were 17 countries represented there across the Middle East and Africa. And creating these connections um, really became a, an environment where people started thinking about what could what could be some some uh, really impactful business outcomes through these kinds of connections. Different from some of the other events that we had done at Startup Nation Central and under, under a similar brand of Connect to Innovate, the women's focus was um, obviously for women alone, but it also looked cross-regionally and not just bilaterally. And it was designed with this kind of non-conference intention mm -hmm. 
where it wasn't a series of panels and keynote speakers and, and workshops after workshops. The whole design went into looking at what happens when you go to a conference. The most interesting part of the conference is what happens on the side, in the hall, in the, you know, over Real. coffee. And so the idea was to bring that into the room. And, um, you know, I, I think you're probably familiar with the question because we got it from everybody when we were leading up to the event. Who are the keynote speakers? Yeah. And what we ended up doing is we had a, a, almost 100 keynote speakers where each one of the participants could have stood on stage in their own right, opposite an audience of 700 uh, influential business leaders. And we created the space where people were sharing their stories, sharing their journeys to business success, journeys to leadership and understanding where there were similarities and where there were differences and where we had our own individual paths to, to success. So um, the, the idea was to, to kind of harness that in three days and see what can come out of those kinds of connections. Yeah, well, it was definitely not the typical conference we're all used to. And probably, uh, why don't you take us through those three days, especially for the audience who wasn't there, um, so can you break down like the, the three days for us? Yeah, um, we started off with a storytelling session, almost like a story slam, but uh, Moroccan style, because it was modeled after the, the uh, ancient Moroccan tradition of hikayat, um, mm -hmm. storytelling. And there were uh, five women participants who had done training before the gathering. Uh, to learn about what does it mean to tell a story in this fashion. And we all sat around in a circle and listened to individual journeys, some of them uh, harrowing challenges and and personal um, personal challenges that they faced from childhood. And, and, and all of a sudden, what do you do with opportunity and how do you break through different glass ceilings and other ceilings and barriers that are put before you? Uh, and it really was just sort of a, a an opening and an invitation that people bring their vulner vulnerabilities into the room yeah. um, and that there's a connection between your personal journey and your professional journey. Hmm. And so we started with that and then led into workshops that focused on um, access to investment opportunities and what does it mean to be a decision maker sitting around the table making investment decisions? Or what does it mean to be on the entrepreneurial side seeking investment? Um, and how does uh, one person's experience from Egypt um, maybe uh, shed light on someone else's experience in Bahrain, for example, or in Israel, or as we said, in all of the countries represented there? Another session was on education. Um, thinking about not just what do we need to learn and where can we create more opportunities around education, but also sometimes what do we need to unlearn in order to recognize where innovation can play a really powerful role in forging our future and the future of our children. Mm. Um, and another piece was focused also on um, infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean not only physical infrastructure and the constructs that make up our lives, whether it's government and regulation, but also society and culture and religion. So in, in all of this is an arc of this isn't just about you when you're wearing your professional hat. This isn't just you when you are in your professional role but it's all of the different aspects that make up make up who we are as individuals. Um, mm. And that was the invitation that people come wearing all of their different hats in society, um, in their families, in their businesses, uh, in their volunteering roles, uh, in all of the roles that they play. We, uh, we brought everybody out to the desert uh, for some Very time. early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, we, we were debating. We're not gonna make too many friends by bringing very high powered women <laughs> um, out at, at 6 a.m. to catch the sunrise. It was um, wonderful. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful. There's magic to being out there and just um, um, seeing everyone experience that together. And we did an activity called Vision Circles, where mm. everybody um, was invited to imagine what the future can look like, mm. um, their own personal future, the professional future, or the future of the region. And there's something about bringing your voice to that vision 
and sharing that vision with others that you've developed a, a relationship with, even over just a short amount of time, vocalizing uh, your ideas in order to to see where they carry you into the future. Um, and we're already hearing uh, it's been a few months. We we got together in May, and now we are in August, the end of August. And I'm hearing some amazing feedback of people that have been taking trips and writing books and doing things that they never thought they would actually do, but there was just something powerful in vocalizing it and sharing that experience. Um, another interesting activity that we did, we actually had a graffiti collaboration where graffiti mm, yeah. artists, a mm. graffiti artist from Israel, a graffiti artist from Senegal, and an artist from uh, Morocco did a collaboration focused on the values that we were talking about during the event. And we did this whole unveil that the city of Marrakesh donated a wall in their cultural center to this uh, to this graffiti work. And so we saw that unveiling and there's just really the power of bringing in art and different forms of articulating leadership uh, into the discussion. So as you can see, there's just a little bit of a flavor of the different yeah. kinds of activities that we did that create very powerful experiences and connections, all with the underlying um, objective of of understanding where business potential, business collaboration can come out of this. Yeah, and I'll I'll put uh, some links to uh, to to a few articles and also our social media. If you're interested in learning more and uh, seeing pictures of of this whole experience, we'll definitely put some links uh, for you in the show notes of this episode. Now, Aviva, as you know, we're really in this era of building communities and digital communities, industry communities, and. I know this question might be challenging, but I feel it's really important to one. Um, how can we quantify uh, and what kind of KPIs can we put in place in order to measure the benefits of such initiatives? From a funder standpoint, you mentioned the funder standpoint, but also from a participant standpoint. I feel this is a really a core question that many of us could relate to and also benefit from. What's your perspective on that? Such an important question. Uh, first of all, on, on community, it's become a buzzword. We use the term community very loosely. And I feel that um, when we talk about community, it's not just about a group of people that have shared an experience together. Uh, to forge a community, there has to be both give and take at the very individual level. Everybody feels that they're giving, that they're contributing, and everybody feels like they're gaining. And uh, I think in that definition of community, for me at least, lies the KPI for something like this and, and bringing people together with the real intention that everybody's going to get something out of it and everyone's going to have what to contribute so that it was worth my time and it will be the wor worth the time of the people that I invite to join this community in the future because it's mm. bringing value to their business and because they're providing value to other people's business. Mm. Um, and so a, a KPI for something like this is really about not the experience itself, the experience mm. itself, the connection itself, the event is a, a jumping off point to then understand, well, what do we do with it now? Now that, now that we have these connections, do we leave it there? And, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit when we were first, um, designing this and kind of putting it out there, uh, we didn't know how it would land. It really was mm. the first of its kind um, type of event. Uh, and and for us as an organization, but also recognizing where we are in the ge geopolitical environment, uh, understanding what the potential could be when you create these kinds of connections. And at the beginning, it was like, let's just make sure it happens. And mm. once it happens, then start thinking about it. And now I can say very confidently that the KPIs for bringing people together and spending their time and sharing their networks is really about where is this adding value to my own society, to my economy? How can this activity and these relationships continue to foster prosperity? Mm. And that's really, uh, I think, something that one could bring to a donor, one could bring to a business sponsor, one could bring to a corporate partner and say, these are the kinds of people to people relationships that uh, will continue to drive for concrete partnerships. And that's really what we're after now. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I really do think it's a very important initiative for female leadership in the region. And it is also really setting the stage for many empowering collaborations to follow. Now, before we dig in deeper into the topic of today, which, as you know, is bring the whole you and embracing our whole self with all its facets. Um, tell us about your journey, especially, you know, your personal growth journey, your a very passionate professional, you're purpose-driven, you're a wife, a daughter, a mom, a four. How do you navigate um, these different roles while staying true to yourself and your aspirations? Well, that's such a weighty question. Um, so I'll start with my purple, my personal journey. I, I grew up in New York. Uh, at age 18, I came to Israel to spend time for a year after high school, and I fell in love with the country. Uh, spent probably, I think it was about six years staying in Israel, did my studies in Israel and international relations, and eventually made my way back to New York. It was right after, uh, sorry, it was right before 9-11. Uh, yeah. And on 9-11, I had an interview downtown for a job. I wasn't there. It was in the afternoon. But um, what I didn't realize was how personally I would be affected by the day. Um, but interestingly enough, from a, from a career standpoint, Shortly after that, I uh, started work at the governor's office of economic development, and the state had just received federal funding for business recovery of lower Manhattan. And because the world hadn't had anything like that at that scale before, it was sort of new to everybody. So even though I was a very young professional, I was just as experienced as anybody else would have been in understanding how to address that from a business community standpoint. And we opened up a walk-in center at Ground Zero. And I uh, kind of fell into what would be the next nine years of my professional journey, which turned out to be, to date, one of the more transformational leadership uh, roles I've been exposed to. And I realized that without getting up to work every day with a sense of passion and purpose, um, nine to five wasn't going to work for me. Uh, mm. and you know, I, and, and that's really where I started unpacking. What does it mean to be in the context of, um, multiple stakeholders? How do you create programming that addresses very vital, sensitive needs, but, um, understands that there are different interests and different goals, uh, with the different parties that you're going to be working with. And, um, over time, I, I I evolved in my role a little bit, um, and then um, at the time I was married with uh, with two kids, and realized that I wanted to come back to Israel. Uh, my husband and I had known for a while that that was the direction, and moved to Israel. It was in two thousand and nine. Moved back to Israel the second time, and. Um, spend time. So I had been in government and then went back in Israel, spend time in nonprofit and really came to understand for myself that um, I like to find roles that haven't been chartered before. That, you know, mm -hmm. I have yet to get have a job that has you know a list of responsibilities on day one. Um, and I've come to learn that that's just what works for me. So uh, I know in your introduction, I was flattered to hear, but uh, the sort of new experiences. So new new experiences for myself uh, and professionally are ones that I seek out. So um, that's my my personal journey in getting to where I am now at Startup Nation Central. Uh, uh, we're a nonprofit organization, non revenue organization, non government organization focused on um, ensuring the health of the Israeli tech ecosystem and connecting it with key stakeholders around the world so that Israeli technology can play a role in addressing global challenges. Uh, and I feel very passionate about the work that I'm doing um, in my role in innovation diplomacy. There's a lot about connecting with leaders in different countries and uh, on different issues that are relevant to um, everybody's day to day. And so uh, I get up in the morning feeling very passionate where that meets my other passions in life and my four children, God bless them, and my husband. And, 
you know, the elusive balance. I still haven't figured it out, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, you, you do what you can uh, every day and give the most of yourself to as much as you can uh, and maintain, maintain um, yourself as a priority and all of that. So it's not easy. I don't have the answer to finding balance. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, it, it's definitely a journey and embracing our wholeness and also the self-acceptance is definitely a journey. Can you probably share with us if there was like a, a defining moment in your personal growth journey that led to, let's say, a realization or transformation into bringing together the personal and the professional? Yeah, I, I would say there are two things that kind of happened simultaneously. Um, one is I, I was part of a fellowship uh, journey that focused mm -hmm. a lot on personal uh, professional leadership. And we did this assessment, and um, I, in that assessment, I scored fairly low on uh, authenticity in the workforce. And I share that with you um, not so easily. It's hard to say mm. something like that about yourself. Thank you for sharing that. I felt like, yeah, you know, this is me, um, and yet I'm being received by my peers as inauthentic. Um, and at the same time, when I was sort of processing that, I was on a work call at home and my husband made a joke about, um, a, he could tell I was on a work call because I have my uh, Aviva work voice and I have my uh, Aviva uh, other voice. And all of a sudden it was like, huh, okay, there's something that is, uh, I'm creating a barrier with how I'm bringing myself to work. Maybe because I feel like I need to put on this kind of um pose that's different from from who I am at home and and in other other roles that I wear um, but it wasn't working for me clearly I thought it was working for me and it wasn't working for me and that to me was an aha moment of okay mm. there is, I, I need to maybe make a shift here and try on what would it feel like to bring to to blur that line a little bit and bring more of my whole self to mm. my professional career. And quite frankly, the other way around, what else can I bring from how I bring myself to work that might be helpful at home? Mm. Um, and I started playing with different, trying on different um, roles or different ways to do that. And for me, I think it has, it has definitely been instrumental in um, my career journey. And today I feel like I can, I can safely say that there's a lot of blurring of the lines and it's risky to do that because then it comes back to that first question that you asked about balance. Cause once you start mm. blurring the lines, where do you, it might be a little bit easier to find that uh, more difficult to find that balance. Mm. Um, but for me, it, it's, it hasn't been, it hasn't been the case for me finding the balance is okay. You know, this is who I am right now in all of what I'm, I'm doing today. And then you can take stock in, in how mm. you're spending your time a little bit more um, authentically. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I was I was reading this great article, Her Herminia Ibarra, she's a professor at INSEAD, and she, she wrote this great article on HBR called The Authenticity Paradox. And one of the points she made that really resonated for me was that when you think about authenticity, particularly um, someone who is closer to the beginning of their career uh, than the end of their career, you have to try on different personas to see which one feels more comfortable. Because, you know, the person who just graduated from college or university a few years ago probably isn't going to be the one that thrives in any workplace, right? You learn, you grow, you figure it out, you yeah. bump into a few things, and then you find the right way forward for yourself. And I remember really when I started in the consulting industry, there was a clear cut between personal and, and professional. And I, I just thought that's how it was supposed to be. Now, as you said also, and I resonate with that very much, as I evolved in my personal growth journey, my perspective on that started to change. And I also really felt inspired by people who were open, authentic, uh, real, but not just when everything was going their way and everything was right and they were happy. Also when, you know, authentic in their doubts, the moments of doubt or vulnerability. And that to me felt, felt 
more aligned with the person I wanted to be and also the kind of role model I wanted to to, to model for my kids. So really it's an evolving journey. And I think her approach on ad adopting and, you know, an adaptive authenticity uh, style and experimenting different leadership approaches can, can work for some of us. That, does that resonate for you as well? It, yeah, I'm nodding my head. It, it resonates completely. Um, for me, I think that there's the fine line though, and you have to know where that line is for yourself vulnerability is something that i value and i i think i i bring to my everyday i'm not necessarily afraid of being vulnerable in in the workplace or as a mother for that matter or a mm. wife or a friend or a daughter um but at the same time um maintaining the right level of professionalism Mm. Um, which is also really important. You know, we we don't want to break down entirely <laughs> in the workplace, but we have to understand where um, where where those lines are. Um, mm. So absolutely, I think that, and, and that speaks to what what you're citing is that adaptive authenticity. I love it. Yeah, and you, I think there's there are a lot of beliefs and. Um, uh, you know, we all have different understanding and we all come from different cultural backgrounds. Also, you mentioned, I loved it. Thank you for sharing that. This anecdote with your husband, you know, immediately identifying work Aviva, not work Aviva, but based on your body language, the tone of your voice and so on. That is so relatable. I think we, uh, a lot of us, uh, we, we, we do that. Can you help us articulate the belief and the thought process behind you know, that decision for some of us to show up differently in our personal life and our professional life. I wonder if if some of that is also um, gender related, uh, mm -hmm. where maybe as women, we feel like if we're sitting around a table uh, of decision makers um, and we need to show up differently professionally. And I wonder mm. out loud, because I think for me, it, it does ring true. Uh, okay. Okay. And and I don't I don't can't speak for others, but I, I I would imagine that that finds a home in some people's understanding, mm. um, and and also that vulnerability piece. This kind mm. of being scared of being vulnerable in the work in the workplace means that you've got to put on a different um, pose. It, mm. <laughs> it reminds me of. Um, if you've ever heard uh, Beyonce talk about who she is off stage versus Sasha Fierce, uh, right? Sasha Fierce, yeah, it's <laughs> who's Sasha Fierce on stage, um, and it's interesting because on the one hand, there's a lot of power in trying on different personas, um, and I think it takes a lot of work to understand where is that helpful to you, and then where does it stray too far from your authentic self. When we put out the invitation to the women that were attending Connect to Innovate, uh, we said the invitation to them was leave a lot of room in your bag for all the different hats you wear. Because mm. when we're having a conversation, and even in this conversation I'm having with you now, mm -hmm. um, I am you know, Aviva on this podcast um, and humbled to be your guest. And mm -hmm. I am thinking about the meeting that I just had, the meeting I'm about to have. And did my daughter take the swim cap to the pool that she was supposed to take today? And what are we having for dinner? And I'm about to entertain 20 people for over the weekend. Like all of the different things that we do, plus my volunteering role. And, you know, and that's that's just me in this minute. And I think is probably many, many people everywhere and certainly many women everywhere. Uh, and so um, the invitation is bring that, bring that into the room because I'm a better professional when I'm also calling on my strengths as a mom and a sister and a friend. And I'm a better mom, sister, and friend when I'm calling on my strengths as a professional. And um, and that's what I mean by blurring the lines and finding that that space where you can bring the whole you. Yeah, absolutely. There is the, the gender bias. I agree with that. There is that perspective. And I would add on also probably the belief for some of us, that authenticity, uh, prob um, vulnerability is associated with weakness. And maybe we at some point have been taught or uh, that bringing emotions to the workplace is unprofessional. And 
which really we need to, you know, un unwrap that at that and, and talk about it. And really, because uh, the reality is, it is also healthy for professional relationships to know how to, you know, um, bring your emotions in a professional way. Like it's, it's, it's okay to be angry. It's okay. I'm not talking about someone that is, you know, screaming all over the place. And, mm -hmm. but anger is a signal of something that is not aligned with your values. And so when you can stand up and express that in a, in a way that is acceptable, of course, in the world, that is something we need in order to bring on different perspective or, uh, you know, emotions are signals also. And so, you know, the emotion mastery, I think we should have more lessons and more courses about that at school. And we're really not equipped uh, before we enter the workplace. So I think there is a lot to unpack there and a lot to work on. And it's really, really fascinating. Um, maybe before we move on to the next segment, uh, le let's talk about how we can bridge the gap between these aspects and, you know, bringing our authentic selves to both spheres. What are some of the insights or key lessons that you've learned about leading with authenticity and bringing your whole self to work? Is there anything you could share with us that could be helpful? Well, you know, you mentioned something just a second ago um, about learning how to do this better. Um, and I, I don't think that I was equipped uh, while I was in school with the skills needed to be emotionally intelligent at work and mm. understanding organizational cues and, um, and and cues that would allow me to bring my whole self into the workplace. And I, I think it's really interesting to understand what kind of lessons can be taught. One of mm. the things that I think is probably the best way to learn or to help young professionals learn how to do that is being exposed to leaders who have done it and, and yeah. done it successfully, which is, by the way, one of the goals that we had in bringing these women from across the region together, especially women and especially in this region, there not being that many um, models to look to and understand, oh, this is this is someone I can relate to because they've had either similar challenges or relatable challenges to the ones that I'm facing. Um, and, and, you know, I think in the, in the Middle East uh, and in Africa, uh, it's different from the kinds of challenges that young professional women are exposed to in the West. Uh, and I think that there's a lot that we could do in modeling. There's a lot that we could do in sharing the stories and uh, being mentors for not even just young professionals, but mentors for other professional women who can um, create that space. And, and I think supporting um, the growth of other women around you uh, so that they can pursue their professional goals, uh, that's a big win. Uh, helping other people do what, they, uh, what they're seeking out to do, where you can boost them up um, and do it while you yourself are bringing your authentic self to bear, um, modeling for me, I think is key. Absolutely. I agree with that. Um, creating the space for one another, you know, to bring those emotions. Uh, Aviva, um, uh, Donna, uh, Raz Levy uh, from uh, Google mentioned the um, psychological safety. I think that's also a big one. So bringing, uh, creating an environment with enough psychological safety for everyone to bring their whole self is really important. And, you know, just creating the space and, uh, and uh, helping each other is, is also a big win. I agree with that. Aviva, you've uh, been involved in many really important initiatives. Uh, that create positive impacts. You mentioned also the recovery after 9-11. Um, what advice would you have for individuals seeking to lead purposeful projects and make a difference in their communities? Uh, I, I think um, at an individual level, but also an organizational level, it's really key to see who else is doing what and who are the partners that you could bring in 
Uh, very often we see, uh, we'll do like a stakeholder mapping and see who else who else can I, is in my immediate space that I can work on with this. Um, and I, I, I like to tune my own sensors and encourage others to tune their sensors and see who else is out there, what else is going on and widen that mapping uh, to see who could be potential partners. Um, mm. So if I think back about the work that we did um, quite a while ago now, but uh, in, in lower Manhattan and, and since any project that I've been involved in, there's a lot of value, not just in for the purpose of gaining buy-in, which is critical, uh, but also to be better. You bring in mm -hmm. the different voices. Um, it, it's challenging because it requires you also to maybe loosen the reins of what ownership of an idea looks like, because the more partners you bring in, you lose a little bit of kind of your hold on the initial idea or your vision because you're inviting other people's ideas and visions into the mix. But that just mm -hmm. makes it stronger. Uh, mm -hmm. So step one for me is always looking at who else is in this space, who else cares about this, who else might care about it if they knew it, and how can I engage different voices for inputs and insights? I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, before we wrap up, Aviva, there are three quick questions I usually ask all my uh, guests. Uh, so first question, what is the best piece of advice that you have ever been given? The best piece of advice I was given was you can have it all, just not all at the same time. Mm. And I was given this advice when I was at a personal juncture of trying to decide on a specific dream job that I had been after and I got an offer and I wanted it so badly. But I was also a young mother with two young kids and I knew that this job would be very um, challenging on my schedule and my attention and my ability to be the kind of mother I wanted to be in that moment. And I was really um, angry even that I hadn't been prepared for having to make that decision. Mm. I'm lucky enough to have been brought up in an environment where as um, a young girl, I was told, go for it, you know, dream big. Yeah. And all of a sudden it was like, wait, I, but I got it. I got the thing I was going for, but I also got this other thing I've been going for and I couldn't reconcile the two. And that piece of advice that was given to me, don't worry, you can have it all. It's just not mm. all going to be right now, allowed me to make a decision that felt right for me in that moment. Yeah, I I like that very much. It brings a lot of peace knowing that you can have it all, but not at, at the same time. As you said, especially for women, uh, you know, the professional curve and the personal curve do not go hand in hand because by the time you're at your peak professionally, it's also the time where you want to have a family for those who choose to do so. So it's really, uh, I, I love that piece of advice. You can have it all, but not at the same time. Thanks. Okay, now what is the worst piece of advice that you have ever been given? <laughs> I'm curious to learn about this one also. The worst piece of advice would have to be, um, Aviva, don't be so ambitious. Hmm. Um, Let me guess, was it a go. male CEO saying that to you? It may have been. <laughs> it's, it's a hard one to swallow. Um, and tied to the first one where you want it all um, and being told, you know, maybe maybe you shouldn't want. Uh, and mm. that, that didn't sit right with me. Yeah, absolutely. And I can totally understand why. Okay, last and final question for you, Aviva. If by magic uh, you could create one rule, one law, one habit that everyone, absolutely everyone on this planet had to follow, what would that be? Wow, I love that one. Um, it would be uh, just when you think you're sure of yourself and you know the answer, you have to stop, pause, do another listening tour to get different perspectives and then come to a decision that you feel, even if you're only 80% sure of, is good enough. Um, if you're too sure of something, you, there are always multiple sides, multiple angles and perspectives. Um, you need you need a you need a widen your scope of input. Um, so 
that would be if I could wave a magic wand before any decisions are made, stop, listen, revisit, tweak potentially, uh, and then go forward with the, the confidence that you need. Aviva, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for your time. I will put the handle of your LinkedIn in the show notes of this episode. If anyone wants to reach out to Aviva, please do so. Share your feedback with us on this episode. Um, I appreciate your time and I'll see you very soon. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.